type them into the chat or unmute yourself and ask directly and I'll be monitoring those. Um, as far as seminars for the rest of the semester, the ones that are virtual will um, from today on just be virtual. We will no longer be meeting um, in person in a room um, except for the um, seminars that are all in person. Um, and also, as always, there is a post seminar discussion uh, with Rich, so you are welcome to join that afterwards. It starts a little bit after five, um, and I will put the Zoom link for that in the chat. Um, so I think with that, today I am honored to introduce Maya Allen. Uh, she's currently at University of New Mexico, but she is an NAU alum, so I'm excited to have her. Um, in cultivating her passion with plants and algae, Ms. Allen's research took root at the U University of Alabama uh, as an undergraduate studying algal systematics. She went on to obtain a Master of Science degree at NAU, where she resolved previously unknown evolutionary relationships of uh, Glossopeloton, a small genus of flowering shrubs native to Western North America. While traveling across the range of Glossopeloton, her intimate experience and observations of subtle climatic and topological changes in habitat magnified her interest in species range distributions. As such, her PhD work at the University of New Mexico focuses on plant colonization and the role of phenotypic plasticity. In returning to her home state of New Mexico, Ms. Allen has researched the history of blackdom the first all black settlement in state in, an, in the state in an effort to recently to rectify the erasure of the black botanical contributions and highlight black botanical experience. Ms. Allen continues this advocacy as one of the co-founders of Black Botanist Week, a social media campaign that went viral in 2020 to promote, encourage, create a safe space for, and find more black people who love plants. Um, and that's what she's going to be talking about today is the history of blackdom. The title of her talk is A Germination of Freedom, How Dryland Farming Nourished the Emergence of Blackdom, New Mexico. So with that, please join me in welcoming Maya. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for that introduction. And thank you for your hospitality and the invitation to speak today, especially to the Graduate Student Association. It's an honor to be here virtually with you all, um, especially at one of the best forestry schools in the country. How could I say no? Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, and I'm a PhD student, as she said, at the University of New Mexico. I grew up here in New Mexico, but I never heard the story of Blackdom. Um, this history is absent from our school curric curriculums. And as a born and raised New Mexico, I didn't know of this um, New Mexican, I didn't know of this community until I actually read a Smithsonian article. So this story has really resonated with me and I hope it does the same for you. I've integrated different sources um, and government documents in order to bring this story to you. And today we're gonna talk about a germination of freedom, how dry land farming nourished the emergence of Blackdom, New Mexico. So Blackdom, as the name implies, was an all black town in southeastern New Mexico. This community of about 300 residents held education at their core, and they're going to use dry land farming to nourish their community. They had the explicit intention of having an agriculture based society. Blackdom was about sovereignty. It was black placemaking at work the creation of sites of endurance, belonging, and resistance. That's what Black placemaking means. And it was about cultivating a safe place for Black people to thrive economically, for Black children to grow up empowered without the oppression of Jim Crow laws and anti-Black violence. And this haven they created wouldn't have been possible without the botanical relationships these people had and that they built. These people moved to an entirely new area. They built their own churches. They had Sunday school. Um, and they really wanted a space for their children to be better off and have a great start to life. 
and they're going to have to learn the land for survival. And this is part of a larger movement. This is part of the all black town movement that occurred from 1865 to 1920. And many of the same drivers that were really pushing people to create blackdom were also the same drivers pushing the entire all black town movement. So one of those was anti black violence. So many of these people were coming from the south and there were actual threats against their lives. And the need for survival was multifaceted in the fact that you had that physical component where you need to actually survive. And then you also had the component of quality of life. And so poverty was another driving factor where you wanted to have the economic freedom to pursue maybe your passion in life or to have a better life for your children. Jim Crow laws were integrally tied to the suppression of Black people in the South and really preventing that upward mobility economically. And then last but not least, a lot of the literature today doesn't really focus on this last point of ambition. Oftentimes, migration out of the South or the All Black Town movement is painted as a push out of the South, mainly driven by those three points that we just discussed. But there's also this component of there's a, a sense of ambition. People want to cultivate their own livelihoods and they want better for themselves. And so Blackdom is a great illustration of that because we have oral histories that really speak to what were the people, the founders thinking when they moved to Blackdom. Additionally, Blackdom is going to be a unique case study for research on Black experience in the Southwest. There's really a dearth in that sense of the literature. And then it's also going to be unique because the climactic fa uh, factors that they're going to face when they get to the Great Plains, especially come, coming from subtropical um, Georgia, for example, with the Boyers. And then lastly, the reason why Blackton is also an interesting place to research is because a lot of the concentration on history is in Oklahoma and Kansas, no doubt, because the majority of all Black towns were founded in those particular states. But before we get into to Blackton, I really want to spend some time to acknowledge the lands that Blackton is going to be founded in. And so here's Blackdom here in the southeastern corner of what is now New Mexico. And this is on the homelands of the Mescalero Apache people. And so it's imperative that we acknowledge the intimate relationship held by the indigenous people with these lands. Native peoples have lived in what we call New Mexico in the, south re the southwestern region of the United States for thousands of years. I mean, they are the original dryland farmers. And so in 1873, this land is gonna be stolen and the Mescalero Apache people are gonna be confined to a reservation of about 463,000 acres. And you'll see that on a future slide. And although Blackdom residents are trying to cultivate their own utopia, we need to be honest about the role homesteading has played in colonization. And homesteading is what Blackdom residents are gonna do. They're gonna take advantage of the Homestead Act. And ultimately, this piece of legislation resulted in the settlement of 270 million acres. Blackdom is going to be estimated to be about 13,000 acres. And the Homestead Act was enacted in 1862, um, signed by Abraham Lincoln. And really the goal of this was to increase access to land. Um, so prior to this, the federal government generally sold unoccupied property to the wealthy. And so this was a way for poor people to access land. Um, Well-intentioned, but again, there are some considerations when homesteading. One, you're going to need to pay a filing fee. That amounts to about $500 in today's funds. Um, and then you're gonna need to have continuous residence on that land. Additionally, you need to improve that plot by building some kind of dwelling or cultivating the land. And so that's gonna require some startup capital. 
And so you have to pay for your tools, you're gonna to have to pay for your seed, your livestock, et cetera. And so there is a financial investment into homesteading, not, I mean, not discounting the fact that many people are going to move across the country in order to homestead. And so it's important to keep in mind that homesteading was by no means free. And so on the map to your right, you can see the homestead patents of Blackdom. Here you can see Dexter. This is a really small town in New Mexico. Um, and the larger town is actually gonna be Roswell. So we'll talk a little bit more about Roswell. And here to the left, this map, again, here's the Mescalero Reservation. Blackdom is going to be this blue dot with the white center. And then here's Roswell. And then you can also see Artesia, just to orient you a little bit. And New Mexico during this time, there is a lot going on in New Mexico. The history is rich <laughs> during the early 1900s. And so Blackdom is really coming into, um, not to sensationalize it, but the wild, wild west, especially in southeastern New Mexico. And so in addition to climate, we're going to talk about all kinds of interesting aspects to the founding of this town um, with historical implications. And so to start, we're going to start with the journey west like many homesteaders. So in 1990, we're gonna have Frank Boyer and Daniel Keyes depart from Georgia on foot and arrive in New Mexico in October. So this is at January, you, you get there in winter and you arrive in fall. And then we're gonna talk about how did they get that startup capital in order to build a town through their formation of the town site company We'll discuss the settlement and really the height of Blackton. And you'll see this timeline again throughout the talk. So to start out, we need to talk about two very important founders, Frank and Ella Boyer. So ultimately, they're going to become two of the three board members during the height of Blackton in 1911. And there's a couple of different stories as to how Blackton came about. One, is that Frank Boyer's father, Henry Boyer, actually experienced the Southwest and he had the vision of, of Blackdom. He saw this as a land of opportunity um, as in a potential place to have a settlement and he conveyed this to Frank. But also we do have records that Frank was a 24th Infantry Buffalo Soldier. And the Buffalo Soldiers, they were integral to protecting settlers moving West. Um, they did things like helping with infrastructure like road building etc um they were an all black uh servicemen in our in our military so he also had experience in the southwest as well but ultimately he had this dream and he made the journey west and so he's going to to journey to new mexico in 1900 he gets there in october and ella boyer his wife and their children are going to move the next year and they're gonna start out homesteading in Dexter, New Mexico, that very close small town to where Blackton will ultimately be. And that's gonna be an important trial period for them to learn the land, learn what kind of crops can grow here, and then just learn the dynamics of New Mexico, the territory at this time. Frank Boyer will ultimately be the president. And then Ella Boyer, she's gonna be super impactful um, for Blackdom. In 1909, she's going to file a desert land claim under the Enlarged Homestead Act, and she is going to own the most land in Blackdom and cultivate that land as well. And so both of these two individuals are going to be super important in terms of Blackdom leadership. And they were really instrumental because they were both college educated. And what we'll see is that the intention behind this Black placemaking, behind this community, really was specific. And one of those intentions was to have a group of educated individuals. And so they're going to utilize their, their education that they had um, to really formulate this community. So the Blackton founding really begins with the founding of the company first, because you need that startup capital before you form your town. And so the company is founded in 1903, and this is going to be done by Frank Boyer and 12 other Black men. Um, and this is going to have an initial capital of $10,000. And that's going to be incredibly important for convincing people to actually move to Blackton. 
And in their articles of incorporation, there's a couple of things I like to highlight. So they're going to support themselves through the cultivation of crops. So that was very intentional. They wanted to establish a system of education, including college. So it was, it was monumental that Frank and Ella had a college education from the jump at this time. And then their ambition was to actually have their own college one day in Blackdom. And then you also wanted to improve and upbuild the moral and mental conditions of the colony. So this was supposed to be an empowered space for all who came. Now the actual town of Blackdom is gonna be established around 1908. So again, we have, you need to have that startup capital, you need some investment. This is, there's gonna be a bit of a lag time before we actually see the town versus having the company about five years early. And ultimately this will be abandoned. This town will become a ghost town around 1928. But in order to have a town, you need people. So there's a recruitment campaign. So the town site company had a targeted advertisement to convince more people to, Black, to move to Blackdom. And there's a couple of trends that you see in these advertisements. One is that you always see um, that there's, not always, but most of the time you'll see that there's no Jim Crow laws. So that's gonna be an incentive for more people to move here. You don't have that same restriction that you have in the South. You have fertile soil, ideal climate. You have some people moving out for their health. And then you often have um, that farmers are preferred. Again, we have those intentional articles of incorporation. We wanna support this community through the cultivation of crops. Additionally, you tend to see that they have that $10,000, right? That putative capitalization of $10,000. So that's another reason. There's money behind this. This is not just a, a dream that's being sold. So at this time in the New Mexico territory, there's a lot of fraud. Um, it's the Wild West, people are getting swindled. And so you have you had the Lincoln County Wars with Billy the Kid in, in the 1860s. Um, and so it's a big investment to pick up and move to New Mexico at this time. And so some people were actually convinced in person. So you also had Daniel Keyes and Frank Boyer traveling to Oklahoma and Texas to recruit people to move to Blackdom and say, you know, this is on my honor. This is a real thing. Here are the supporting documents to do that. In additional, in ad additionally, recruitment was also, there was no mistake. The name was very intentional. It's called Blackdom. Um, so this is an empowered space. There was, you heard the name and you, <laughs> there was not much else to, to, to wonder about, but they also were going to need multiple professions so although the target was farmers, you still needed to have school teachers because you wanted to have a school. You'll need people from the clergy if you wanna have a church. Um, and so you're gonna have the recruitment of multiple professions, but the majority of people moving to Blackdom were former sharecroppers from the South. And this recruitment worked. Farmers answered the call. They're gonna encounter challenges that will necessitate that they use scientific innovation to survive. And this is what they're going to be coming to. So this picture here, this is what that area would have looked like around the early 1900s. So it's Budalua Iriopoda, Black Grama, and then Soap Tree Yucca, Yucca Ilata. That's the dominant species that you see there. In the foreground, you'll see this is what Blackdom looks like tonight. today. It's very dry. There's not a lot of green. Um, and so this is going to be a shock. This is going to be a, a big change from the South, and you're going to be dealing with low precipitation levels comparatively. And it's going to force, it's going to challenge Blackton residents and it's going to force them to innovate and adjust to these new climate regimes in the Southwest. Their livelihood, again, was centered on successful agriculture. In addition, to precipitation, you're also gonna have some limestone dominated soils. You're going to have the Pecos River coming down here. So, so Blackdom's around here somewhere, but ultimately it's gonna be a little too far. It's gonna be about four kilometers away for them to actually irrigate using the Pecos River. But Roswell is experiencing a boom, that larger city that's to the North because 
Um, artesian waters are discovered in 1890. So there is an agricultural boom and that is going to help when dealing with limestone heavy soils. As long as you have irrigation, you can still have productive soils with that soil type. And then um, here's a picture of artesian water. So that pressure builds up, it shoots up the water and so that you don't need a pump. And that's really helpful in terms of offsetting some economic costs with well drilling and pumping. So to combat these challenges, and given their economic circumstances, Blackdom residents are really going to utilize dry land farming. And dry land farming is contingent on rainfall. So you need great precipitation in order to successfully do dry land farming. Again, they're going to be a little too far from the Pecos River, and they're not going to have permanent surface water at the location of Blackdom, and then you're going to have economic restrictions, essentially, to digging their own artesian wells. They are quite expensive at about $4,000, and then even hand pumps are expensive at this time. And so they're going to utilize dry land farming. And what's great about this, I'm sure this is no surprise to many of us because we're in the Southwest, is they, we have a monsoon season. So monsoons work because what happens is your, your cooler ocean heats at a different rate than the land surface. So here we have our solar radiation. Our land surface is heating up quite quickly relative to the ocean. And so you have this pressure change because of that. So that high pressure among the cooler ocean is going to navigate to the area of low pressure right here above that warm land surface. And then that water will ultimately go up. It's, it's also in, it's in the air. And then that water is going to condense and voila, you're going to have precipitation. And so this is what, this is going to be the saving grace of Blackdom because they're going to need to have good monsoon re years in order to dry land farm. Additionally, we talked about those heavy limestone soils, but we also see in these advertisements that they're talking about, oh, the climate is delightful and the soil is rich and productive. The, and that earlier advertisement, we saw that they talked about fertile soil. Hmm, what are they talking about here? So in this region, you also have loam, which is a combination of sand, silt, and clay. They're in the perfect proportions that they are, they produce the soil that's great for plant growth because it retains the water but it also drains well. And so that sand is the larger particles that allow for that drainage and aeration. The clay is smaller and more compact, but it provides great nutrients. And that silt is that intermediate particle size between that sand and clay, and it helps them all mix together. And so this is gonna prevent your plants from sitting in water and partic in particular alfalfa really likes loam. So these are the conditions. This is the setting. Again, we had that journey west in 1900. In 1903, we had the company founded. Then we have a targeted recruitment campaign. And we're really going to start to see settlement really take off about five years later when we're really starting to see Blackton settle. And so this is the precipitation at that time. So on your y-axis, you have precipitation in inches. On the x is the year. At 16 inches, you see this dashed blue line. This is going to be the minimum precipitation needed for dry land farming. And this is, this is for novices, people coming to the region. This is not applicable to the indigenous people because we know that indigenous communities can farm at 12 inches a year. So lastly, the other thing is the colors. So the average max temperature for each year is illustrated with warmer colors being the warmer years and then cooler colors being the cooler years. So here we are when Frank Boyer first makes his journey. We have the company start up at 1903 and then we're starting to have people settle around 1908. And the other property that's really important about the soils of this region is that they can capitalize on these good wet years. So you can have some buffering of the drought years where people are actually getting there by soil moisture being retained. 
And in dry land farming, that means you can't till the soil like you would in some other areas because that's gonna expose that soil and moisture will be released. But ultimately the overall trend is for most of Blackdom's establishment, we're well below those 16 inches. However, despite this, the people of Blackdom were able to cultivate several crops. So we'll start with alfalfa. Alfalfa was in a super crucial crop during the latter 19th century. Um, this was gonna be the source of economic stability for many homesteaders um, and Western farmers due to its success. It's a great dry land crop and it has a wide tolerance of different soils. Um, so Frank Boyer during his trial period before Blackdom had one of the largest hay harvest businesses in Dexter, New Mexico, when him and Ella were there. And they were also growing alfalfa, piloting this out before we get to Blackdom. And there's some several things about this particular plant that makes it well suited for this environment. One, it's well adapted to drought. It can grow deep roots to reach groundwater, so it could go up to 20 feet. And then it likes that well-drained soil. So that loam is excellent because it prevents the alfalfa from sitting in water. Another common crop, this is the predominant crop grown by Blackdom residents is sorghum bicolor. And this, this crop has particular significance to the African-American community because it was first cultivated in Africa. It was introduced to America by enslaved African people. And then it was grown in substance plots by enslaved people. So it has had a monumental impact on the survival of enslaved African people in the Americas because that substance plots, that's where you grow your own food to sustain yourself. Um, this is gonna be crucial to feeding, feeding them. And we have records of at least six Blackton farmers growing cultivars of this species. And this species is an excellent targeted crop to grow in this area because it has a super large root to leaf sur surface area ratio. It can actually roll up its leaves to lessen water loss um, during drought. And then if the drought continues, it's, it's above what it can tolerate. It's actually going to go dormant rather than die. Additionally, sorghum by color has waxy a waxy cuticle, so that also helps. And then it also can grow in fertile soil. Most plants can, right? It can tolerate salinity. Um, and then it minimally taxes your soil nutrients, which is great for, for long-term soil health. So if you aren't familiar with sorghum by color, here's a couple of examples here at the bottom. In Blackdom, we have four different records of sorghum by color being grown. Um, so we have cane sorghum, which can produce like a, like a molasses or a syrup. Um, kefir, this is crossed out because sometimes this is used as a slur, milo maize, and federite. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. But sorghum, you can use the um, grain, like the inflorescence heads like this. You can see that package here. You could also make a flower out of it. Some people love, 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 love sorghum pancakes. Um, but many of these cultivars, like the species itself, have their roots in Africa. So for example, kafir is originally from South Africa. They have thick, juicy stems and large leaves. Um, and then you can have seeds of varying colors. Milo sorghums, um, they're from East Africa and they have, their stems aren't as juicy, but their, their leaf blades are very, very waxy and they actually have a yellow midrib. Um, and then this particular cultivar is more drought tolerant as well. And then last but not least is federite. This came from Sudan. They don't have as many leaves, but this is gonna be super important generally in the early 1900s because of its drought tolerance. So you're seeing this grown in the Southwest actually commonly, it was not unique to Blackdom. One is drought tolerant, but it's also very productive if you have limited uh, rainfall conditions. So you can have that economic stability where you can still cash in your crop, even if you have a poor year. And Ella Boyer, she's going to grow federite on her 50 acres of land in Blackdom. She's going to have the largest acreage recorded 
um, of this particular cultivar and in general. In addition to their crops, they also had a community orchard. And apples were actually one of the first crops planted at Blackdom, but they had an, an orchard of small fruit trees. They had plums and peaches as well. And this you'll see referenced commonly, that this was really a place of very high significance to the people of Blackdom. It was a communal um, endeavor. It was something they all partook in. And you see that it really meant a lot to people in this community to have this community orchard. And, and the citations are at the bottom of all my slides if you wanted to read more about them. In addition to their community orchard, many of the residents of Blackdom had their own garden, but they also shared. So if someone had, for example, we have records of the profit farm, they had a wonderful watermelon harvest one year and they shared with the entire community. And so that naturalism and that farm to table practice was really important. And some of the records that we have is we have lettuce, which is in the background here. You have corn, cantaloupes, onions, sugar beets, tomatoes. Um, so yes, they had this intentional crop selection where you're growing things at a larger scale because you need to be cognizant of the soil moisture and the precipitation levels of each year. But then you also have these smaller gardens that were primarily for the family, but we do have some records that they use this for their own consumption, but they also took some of these to market as well. And what really this illustrates is that communal work for a communal harvest, whether it's in your orchard or it's sharing in your labor or your harvest of your watermelons is that that's incredibly important for Black place making. It cultivates a space that you can retain your botanical knowledge systems or help share in knowledge that, that you're acquiring in this new environment. You can instill the values of land stewardship and you can provide access to healthy foods, something that you, that you grew yourself. And you can see this still manifesting today. So, for example, you have the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. This company sources heirloom and other non-hybrid seeds, and it really emphasizes those that grow well in the mid-Atlantic region because that's the region of farmers they're targeting. They create lectures and workshops, so you still have that sharing of botanical knowledge, um, and you're trying to preserve the aspects of this livelihood that have largely been lost. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The Tr Detroit Black Community Food um, Security Network is an excellent example of a community garden and they are directly tying food sovereignty to social justice. And if you wanted to read some more about this, Monica White in her book, Freedom Farmers, uses this as an example, especially in integrating how do these manifestations of Black placemaking tie into resilience? Like, what does this mean for the Black community? That's an excellent book if you're interested in that. And then additionally, these communities may have shifted in space a while ago. It may be recent depending on when that migration took place. But you also see community gardens manifest in Soul Fire Farm based in New York, which is a black and brown led project that also works towards food and land justice. And Farming While Black is a wonderful book that was very, very popular. Um, it's a comprehensive manual for you know, African heritage, um, and people who are seeking to reclaim this place, this sense of identity with farming in the land. And ultimately what we've seen in the black farmer community is that there are less black farmers today than in 1920. And that's true for farmers across the board. But when you consider the, the massive reduction in black farmers, we went from 14% of, Af of African-American farmers in the 1920s to one to 2% now. And for those of you who are in the seminar class, 
we'll we'll discuss we'll dive into this much more but for those of you that are just here for right now basically the shorthand explanation for why this is is discriminatory lending practices by the USDA and then also the legacy of slavery and how that trauma can manifest in future generations put simply I had to do this forcefully. I want you to do something else. But for Blackdom, Blackdom's going to receive national recognition for their farming. So Frank Boyer and Lloyd Allen. So here's Frank Boyer, Lloyd Allen. We're not related <laughs> that I know of. Um, so they're actually going to attend the Negro Farmers Congress as delegates and share in this knowledge and this experience of cultivating Blackdom um, with other farmers across the country. And Blackdom is really going to have a period where they're going to have a height. Like there, it, it does go well for, despite the low precipitation levels, it goes well for a little bit. They achieve getting their own post office. That's huge. In 1912, Blackdom has its own post office. They have their own school, which is here in the background. Here are their teachers, uh, Mr. Wagner and Mr. Malone. He's always got this fly hat on in his pictures. Um, and ultimately, they're going to also have the church, they're going to have a store and an office building. In terms of the number of residents, this fluctuates in the documentation I've seen. Um, I think 300 is a fair estimate, but I've seen it range from 150 to 800. But I think it's about 300 residents at the height of Blackdom. And so they get their post office in 1912. They're doing good despite the conditions. Um, and then ultimately, what we're really going to see is the drought of 1917, compounded with a few other things, is, is really going to be detrimental to Blackdom. It's going to be very hard to bounce back from this. And we'll see a couple of ingenious ways to deal with that, and then ultimately Blackdom will be abandoned. So in, 19, in 1917, I think I said 1912, but I meant 1917 earlier. In 1917, we're going to have an awful drought. So it's going to be devastating for the community. Again, we do have that property of retaining some soil moisture from the good years, but nothing's going to quite buffer this. And Blackdom is re relying on precipitation really at this time. Many people couldn't afford to dig their own wells and do the things that, that could supplement or help buffer these very, very poor years. So water, water is going to be a vital resource that's imperative today and was imperative then. So again, we have those um, artesian wells where you don't need a pump, you can have the water shoot straight out of the ground, and that contributed to a large agricultural boom in this region, but it was expensive. It was about four grand to dig a well. And then additionally, with that boom, you had a lot of people digging wells in the Pecos Valley. And so the water table is going to drop and you're no longer going to have that artesian water just coming up. You're going to have to have some kind of way to pump that water up. Given this water table dropping, the New Mexico state engineer is going to actually ban new artisan artesian wells from being dug. So there's no more opportunity for anyone after a certain point. And Blackdom residents, they tried to dig their own wells. Um, and this is a quote from Lillian Collins. If you notice the little girl with the sheep carriage in the beginning, this is her speaking. She says, we couldn't, couldn't get the well through because of the rock. I mean, it was solid rock. So they couldn't dig their own wells. Um, one important exception to this is that Ella Boyer did have two miles of irrigated ditches. She's the only one that we have any evidence that did, did have a way to supplement when we had low precipitation. Um, and she also had a 16 horsepower pumping plant. And this is probably why, I'm fairly sure, this is why she was able to cultivate the highest, the highest acreage in Blackton at 50 acres. So she combined having this resource with that targeted crop selection in order to have that number of acres being cultivated. But primarily, most Blackdom residents, um, they, they're, they're going to be out of luck. Um, of the, the plants that we do, of the water pumps that we do know of, they're, 
they're really only for like bath water um, and in the house use. We do have some records of people walking the four kilometers to the Pecos River to get water, but that's not sustainable for actually supporting your, your crops. That's not gonna, that is, you know, that's a lot of work. Um, so ultimately, Blackdom, Blackdom residents are gonna have to innovate. If that weren't bad enough, their community orchard is gonna be destroyed by a worm infestation in 1916. And that was, a, that was a, a place of really high importance to the community. And this is going to, in terms of your determination, um, your emotions, this is gonna hit differently than the precipitation. In 1917, you're also going to have a big economic pull to Roswell. So Roswell has a military institute. And so you're going to have job opportunities increase in Roswell, given that World War I is occurring. And then lastly, you're also going to have several men drafted out of Blackdom into World War I. So that's when we first start getting the draft too. Okay, so that's a lot. Um, and so what do you do? You, you can't get water. Your, your community orchard is, is gone. The water tables drop. The, there's more alkaline in the soil. Um, and then some of your people are gone and they're at war. And so what Blackdom residents are ultimately going to do is they're going to pull this drought-stricken land together and they're going to form the Blackdom Oil Company a couple years later. And so they, at this time, there's actually an oil boom going on in southeastern New Mexico. Some people nicknamed it Little Texas. And they're going to use this land to lease to major developers in New York and California. And this is going to be worth about a million dollars in today's funds. Now, it's, it's short-lived, right, because the Great Depression is is, is it's on the horizon. So oil prices ultimately collapsed during the Great Depression in the 1930s. But it, this was very important for providing that financial capability to move out of Blackdom and restart. And so ultimately, we have the drought come in 1917. We also have the war come in 1916 is when we lose the orchard. So this is a tough couple years. And then we're going to form our Blackdom Oil Company. We have the economic means to move out of Blackdom. And within about 10 years, we're going to start, basically, Blackdom is abandoned. So we start seeing people move out of Blackdom about 1920 is when we start seeing people move out. Um, but by 1928, basically, Blackdom is a ghost town. And some of the things that people did for example, the Boyers, they moved to Vado, which is a little farther south. Um, it's in Doña Ana County, and it has fertile soil. It's got easy to irrigate land. Um, and so Frank Boyer and his family are going to move to Vado, New Mexico. And he was also familiar with this, this region um, because he was a Buffalo soldier. And he also was a buggy driver for a while, too, when he first moved to New Mexico. So he's doing the homesteading in Dexter, who's he was a jack of all trades and then also being a buggy driver. And so he had scoped this out in advance as well. Um, the Boyers, there are still Boyers today here in New Mexico. Education is incredibly important still. Um, one of the Boyers, she does um, college preparatory courses for, for students in high school. Um, and then she also does trainings for the parents to how to best support your adolescents to aiming for college. Um, and so the Boyers did that. There's a couple of other families that moved to Albuquerque. So basically the Blackton Oil Company is going to allow these people to disperse throughout the state. And when this happens, many newspapers are going to depict Blackton as a failed social experiment. It's a little disheartening to see, to read how people kind of interpreted this. Um, they depicted Blackdom as a failure. It was almost celebratory, um, but Blackdom wasn't a failure. Given those precipitation levels, it's amazing that Blackdom residents were able to cultivate crops at all. 
Um, and although Blackdom no longer exists, it still served as a vehicle for economic freedom. These people found a home in New Mexico. It may not have been at the original Blackdom site, but many of those families are still here and the tenants still live on in their great grandchildren. Blackdom served as a foundation for the culture, the ideas and the strength and ingenuity, no less, to live on through the descendants of the people who lived there. So Blackdom wasn't a failure because Blackdom wasn't just a town, it was a vision. There's my citation. Thank you, Maya. You're welcome. <laughs> Awesome. That was great. Um, yeah, I'm really surprised. I mean, I did not grow up in the Southwest, but um, I'm really surprised that even you growing up in New Mexico um, did not learn about that in, in schools. So um, yeah, really amazing piece of history. Thank you. Okay, let's see if you guys have um, any questions. You, we have a few minutes for, um, for a discussion in this Zoom chat. Um, let's see, Jim just had a comment about sorghum, saying that he uh, spent time in um, Southern Africa, and they also made an alcoholic beverage out of sorghum there. That's cool. Yeah, I should have put that on the slide. That's it's super cool. There's just so many uses for sorghum. It's awesome. Such a cool plant. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question. Thanks, Maya. This was a nice presentation. I learned a lot uh, from it. I'm just wondering where agroforestry practices was practiced in the area as well. Agroforestry, was it practiced in the area? Like, like growing, uh, growing trees with crops and uh, trees, like mixing it in a, in a, in a fixed, farmland? Was mm -hmm. it practice? So as far as I know, the answer is no. Um, so in the region, it tended to be that the, the croplands were separated from the orchards. So there are orchards within the Pecos Valley that were different than Blackdom, more of the larger trees. Um, and so, but they weren't intermixing like alfalfa growing with, with their orchards. Um, but so your general kind of monoculture is what you can think of was happening at that time, as far as I know. Um, now for, for, for Blackdom, I don't know if the orchard was separate from the gardens. I, it sounds like from the homestead patents that like the sorghum and the crops, like the alfalfa, those are grown separately. But spatially, I couldn't really tell if some of the larger gardens were also grown with the orchard, like where was the orchard? So that was a little difficult to tell. There are records of the, the each homestead having their own little garden. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do know that people each, like families had their own little garden, but then in terms of shared communal garden, where was that in relation to the orchard? That I don't know. Um, but a great question Th and thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Awesome. Um, again, um, Jim Allen says, very interesting talk. You mentioned there are some organizations um, or some organizations like the one in Detroit. Um, are you aware of any in this area? Oh, that's a great question. So great. Okay. So as far as I know, when I was leaving NAU, this was like clearly not um, solely like a black garden, but the conversation that was happening within the um, Office of Inclusion was there was a community garden. It's over there by the greenhouses near biology. Um, and it, it was kind of falling into flux in terms of the leadership and then retentions of students. And so there was discussions of taking that over, but it wouldn't be like a black 
space, it would be like a multicultural where all of the student success centers have student participation in that. Um, and I don't know where that's at now, but in terms of at Northern Arizona University, I know there was discussions about that. And that could be a potentially great collaboration between the School of Forestry or Biology or whomever um, with the Student Success Centers. And then I can't remember the name of the student organization that used to work with the, the garden, but yeah, that could be something to look into. As in terms of Flagstaff, no, I don't know of any. Um, there is a national program called Outdoor Afro. It's different because this is not about um, like an agriculture sense in terms of growing things. It's more of an outdoor sense. Um, so Outdoor Afro is, is trying to, trying to put it in very short terms. So because there was a lot of violence in outdoor spaces, there, are, there's, there can be a lot of fear of participation in those spaces. So Outdoor Afro is trying to build a community that reconnects with the land in terms of going out and hiking and increasing Black people's participation in outdoor spaces. Um, and so there's chapters across the country. I, I'm not sure if there's one in Flagstaff, but I'm pretty sure there, there probably is some in Arizona. There are some in New Mexico, um, but that would be what, what I'm familiar with. The other thing, that's a little bit more um, politically might be a little bit different. Um, you have to is the um, the All African People's Revolutionary Party. They tend to do a lot with community gardens. It's all good information. I was just trying to see if Outdoor Afro had a, a chapter in Arizona. I can't find that right now. Um, let's see. Um, Jill Beckman asks, was this the only black only or was this the only black only town established in New Mexico during this period? No, um, there's another town that was um, so they're in southeastern New Mexico. This was very much on, it's, it's eastern New Mexico, very close to Texas. It's not quite northeast New Mexico. It's like in between. There was another town there. Um, it's not considered a settlement or a town because of, it, was, it wasn't there very long and they didn't construct dwellings, et cetera. Because what ultimately happened is that this town or this, this settlement came into being, but they were run out by Texans. Um, and so that establishment piece didn't really happen. So that's why it's not, that's why Blackton is considered the first all black settlement in New Mexico. It's kind of like the definition of settlement there. Vado, sometimes people call that an all black town, but Vado was already established. Um, so, I don't consider Vado an all black town. It's just that a lot of people from black to move to Vado, but Vado was already there. Um, and Vado now, cause Vado is still here today. Vado now is, is largely Hispanic. So um, Vado wasn't, some people classify it and some people don't. Awesome, good question. Um, Carolyn also says she really enjoyed your presentation. Um, she also grew up in New Mexico and had never learned about Blackdom, so that's interesting. Um, Matt Bowker asked, or he says he imagined Blackdom's crops were heirlooms originally brought in from other states. Um, are those varieties known and do they still exist? So I've had questions before about where did they get the seeds? I don't know. I'm not sure if they brought them in or if they purchased them in New Mexico. Um, in terms of the varieties, we have those common names that I had listed for the sorghum. So a lot of times in um, the homestead testimonies, they, they don't, they call them like some kind of common name, but it's like, well, what is that? Especially because it varies regionally. Um, and then even sometimes in the state too, you can, like people will call things different, different common names, but we're not really sure what they are. So in terms of some of those, we do know like what particular cultivar they are um, or variety, but 
we don't have, like, for example, the families, we don't have any records or descendants that, that kept the seeds. Um, and so that's been, yeah, we don't, and we don't really know. They never asked in any of the oral histories, well, where did you purchase your seeds or did you bring them here from your, your previous farms? That we don't know. It would be really interesting to find out though. Yeah, I wonder if they do still exist or not. Um, uh, Rich mentioned that I think the snail garden might have been what you were talking about earlier. I um, think so. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the snail garden. There was a whole article on it in the, oh my gosh, oh man, what's this gold newspaper called? The Lumberjack? I don't know. <laughs> I can't believe I can't remember, but the they had a whole article about it, but that would have been years ago. I doubt I can even find it. Yeah, it's in 2017. 2017, okay. Yeah, yeah. it didn't fit the beauty of standards of the university. So they kind of put pressure on the club that uh, in the garden at that time. And I think it had been going for about five years yeah. before that. It would, I would, it would be lovely to see that started back up again. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's some momentum to get it going again. And I know Matt Balker and others, Anita, in our program are working there as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And this is really cool. Um, I'm sorry if I am uh, mispronouncing your name. Rendizia or Rendisha um, has a... Um, an urban forest project in Tucson um, and also put a link to their uh, website. Um, this is amazing. I have yeah, which is up. awesome. I have to share this with all my Tucson and Phoenix <laughs> friends. Do I, may I do that though? <laughs> Just <start> sharing it. <laughs> Please do so. Please okay. share our information. We just had, we had a fantastic event on this past weekend where we're installing um, more of the food forest. So it's, it's definitely a wonderful project that we have right in the middle of the city. Oh, thank you so much for the work you're doing. This, that's phenomenal. Thank you. Awesome. Um, we have less than a minute if anyone has any other uh, burning questions. And let me put the Zoom link in the chat while we're waiting. Awesome. Um, if there's no other questions, um, I just want to thank you again. If everyone wanted to unmute themselves and, um, and give an actual round of applause, they are welcome to do so. Thank you. Great job, very interesting. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Maya. And um, we'll meet in the other room, but give you like 10 minutes or so break um, 